Good Ladies morning, and Judge Sykes. Good morning, everyone. Judge Rovner will be with us, obviously, by video. First case this morning is uh, Izell versus City of Chicago. Ms. Luce. Good morning. May it please the court. Suzanne Lose. I represent the city of Chicago, the appellant and cross appellee in this case. This morning, I will explain that Chicago's zoning of shooting ranges and um, the age restriction at those ranges do not run afoul of the Second Amendment, nor does the age restriction violate the First Amendment. I'll explain that the district court erred in ruling that assigning shooting ranges to M districts violates the Second Amendment, but correctly ruled that the 500 foot buffer and age restrictions are constitutional. These provisions should be upheld under the framework this, set out, this court set out in Azal 1, and um, time permitting, I will address the substantial burden test for regulations as well. This case calls for less stringent scrutiny than did the absolute prohibition of shooting ranges. Does the city really want shooting ranges in Chicago? Do we want, of course, we've made, we've made room from Well, that. I would say, of course, we, you're we the want, only city in the country that doesn't have any. Your Honor, we want to comply with this court's order and have, t have taken yeah. major steps in doing so by undertaking a, a regulation to make sure that shooting ranges can come to Chicago and can do so in a fashion that, um, that uh, promotes public safety. During the course of the uh, submission of evidence, uh, your expert witnesses didn't seem to have any evidence. Our Rule 30b-6 witnesses? Well, they were there to explain the reasons for the, the zoning, the right. Chicago zoning, and, did they, and have they any, did offer several reasons. Did they have any background uh, to present, any data to present? They did not present data. They did present our reasons, and uh, and were not limited to the evidence that they actually well, had. Well, presenting reasons based on what? Their reasons, based on their in Miss Gutierrez's case and her experience in zoning and identifying what kinds of uses are intense uses, by noting the nature of of the particular use at issue. Um, and well, because. Um, Commissioner Crimble uh, was a Rule 30b-6 uh, witness. In what context uh, are we allowed uh, to attribute her testimony uh, to merely her personal opinion? Well, I would submit that uh Commissioner Crimble was called to testify about, well, she did, did testify about two things. She testified about what would, she was called there to testify to as a Rule 30b6 uh, witness, the reasons for the age restriction. But she also testified about how she thought the law should be changed. Um, and the reasons that she gave uh, were that the city does not want children and guns in the same place um, or children running around while guns are being fired. And that uh, testimony is wholly consistent with the notion that children- Had she ever been in a shooting range or firing range? I believe she testified about that. She, I believe she, she had, had been once. I believe she was unsure- I'm sorry, I did not hear your answer. I believe she was asked about that and she was unsure she may have been. But I don't believe her presence in the firing range is did relevant. Did she see any children she... running around in that firing range? Your Honor, she testified about her son going to a class, and these are her views of, of, of the, okay. her other comments about her own son's experience in a shooting ring and what, and what might be wrong with the ordinance or how it should be changed do not bear on the city's reasons for the age restriction. Um, that testimony was irrelevant, and to the extent it was offered as a legal conclusion, uh, it's not an appropriate subject of any witness testimony. That's for the courts to decide. Um, the problem is that it's your obligation to support your reasons with evidence, and the record doesn't demonstrate that that burden was carried. Well, I, hopefully you'll give me uh, um, a moment to demonstrate that I think that we have carried our burden. And if I can start with um, 
the zoning restrictions themselves, um, those survive intermediate scrutiny um, because they are, they are substantially related to port, important public safety objectives because there is a lot going on um, at shooting ranges to justify distancing them from pop, more populated areas, um, such as the potential for gun theft, lead contamination, fires, and noise pollution. As for gun theft, we cited right. those um, concerns may justify um, targeted regulations. Maybe that's a poor word here. Um, narrowly tailored regulations, um, such as you know noise buffers in terms of the building itself and um, other safety precautions with regard to the environmental concerns, mm -hmm. and and those aspects of the city's ordinance were. Um, upheld and are not being challenged here. Um, the question is whether they justify this kind of use restriction. We submit that the city is permitted to take more than one precautionary measure when you're dealing with such a dangerous activity. Um, right. My point is that use restrictions, use zoning, um, is prohibitory, not merely regulatory. I'm sorry. Building codes are regulatory. Um, area requirements like lot size and setbacks and building size, those are regulatory. What we're talking about is use zoning here, which is prohibitory. I would say this is this is a, is a regulation. It's a use regulation. It regulates, regulates the place of, okay. of, a, of a particular Different kind of zoning. There's, there's area zoning and there's use zoning. Use zoning is restrictive, it's prohibitory. In other words, a use is prohibited everywhere, or is prohibited everywhere it's not permitted. It is prohibited in the zones where it is not, th that permitted. is correct under the zoning ordinance. Right. But that entire scheme is a regulation of the place. I mean, all of the city of Chicago is designed in different zones to try to, um, foster development of all kinds. My point is that the city's reasons, its concerns about theft, its concerns about environmental contamination, its concerns about fire hazards can be addressed by more narrowly tailored regulations that are aimed at those concerns rather than these uh, use restrictions which have so minimized the locations where ranges can be cited that you know, and and if I might add, I am not at all sure uh, that I understand your argument about break-ins and gun thefts at shooting ranges um, affecting crime in the neighborhood. I understand the argument um, that people coming and going might be targets, but do we really think that thieves break into the range uh, steal guns stored uh, or sold there and then immediately use them just outside the range doors? Well, I don't know that we have to show that. We do show that, that gun ranges and shooting ranges with gun stores, as we learned um, most of them generally do have gun stores, um, does, they do attract crime. Um, and bringing that crime into a neighborhood is wait wait is, wait where did you show I, when did you show we, that we're not talking about gun stores we're talking about we shooting ranges. Talking did you about say shooting ranges store? which are like, right. have gun stores in them and what about the ones that don't have gun ranges let's talk about that there are, are also thefts at gun at gun ranges that do not have stores we have testimony high from, crime area around shooting ranges we have Here's the evidence that we have. We have evidence of 14 examples within a couple of years of both shooting ranges um, and gun stores. Did you um, read through that list and see how many times shooting range was mentioned as opposed to gun gun stores? There were shooting ranges involved. Once. Well. Mm -hmm. One time. The testimony in this case shows that shooting ranges and gun stores go hand in hand. Mr. Lieutenant Falstrom talked about all the ranges in the Chicago area that he knew about also sold ranges, and we heard testimony from plaintiff's experts talking about Well, the shooting the ranges in Chicago are only for government, for police, and... In the Chicago area, uh, in the Chicago area, the ones surrounding the Chicago area. Did those now, thefts produce collateral crime in the immediate neighborhood? No, we do not have evidence of that. 
But nevertheless, we do have evidence that, you know, gun stores and gun ranges, shooting ranges, are going, you know, are attract, do attract theft. They attract. Um, like gas stations and uh, convenience stores? Not like gas stations and convenience stores because because the robbers of gas stations and convenience stores do not come out with large caches of firearms that are very often recovered in violent crimes down the road, as Lieutenant Falstrom testified. Um, so I submit Ms. Luce, from, from a policy perspective, now that gun ownership um, is permitted within Chicago, wouldn't, would it not be better to have places where citizens can be trained in the safe use of firearms? Well, I, the, the Chicago zoning ordinance does allow for places where citizens can be trained in the safe use of firearms. Um, and but you, you continue to put impediments well, I would, um, to those places. We have we have put in regulations, um, many of which are no longer challenged and many of which have been changed. We are not simply putting impediments before shooting ranges. And as for uh, the opportunity to open a range, there is still plenty. There's, there's, there are plenty of places that shooting ranges can, um, can find a place to set up a shooting range and open their business. There's over 33,000 acres, 1,900 parcels of land. And moreover, um, the one person we know of who has made an effort to find a place that meets those requirements found a spot. That's Mr. Dion Robach. His, his uh, deposition is at two, R227-4. He shopped around in the M districts. He made a few phone calls to the zoning administration office um, to check on compliance, and he found a spot, which he did not. Um, he had other business opportunities. He put this plan on the back burner, but that was his testimony. This is not an insurmountable burden. Um, there is plenty of land available for, for development of shooting ranges in Chicago. Well, the fact that there is no range in the city limits four years hence suggests that you've made it infeasible. Well, I would submit that's not, it's not a, uh, that does not mean that the zoning provisions make it infeasible to open a range. Uh, the range has been under litigation the entire time. Uh, regulations have changed a lot along the way. Um, and we deposed, we actually deposed several witnesses who were identified as people who wanted to open ranges in Chicago to find out what their plans were and what the um, impediments were. And we heard, it's, you know, it's expensive. It takes time to put, to get, put together a plan. And the regulations were uncertain. Mr. Pearson, for example, uh, with the ISRA testified that, um, you know, he would have to wait and see how the regulations turned out uh, at the end of this litigation. So we identified people who were interested and we asked about, about um, their pursuit. And none of that revealed that zoning was a roadblock in their view. One person, right? I'm sorry? One person. Sure. We, you know, we undertook discovery in this area. We talked to uh, Chris Hart at Action Target to identify all those who had spoken to him about the possibility of opening a range in Chicago. Now, Action Target is uh, the major outfitter of gun ranges. And um, and we we spoke to the people to the people he identified, and none of them identified zoning as the major barrier. Um, Miss Luce, what, what what about the fact that um, people may now own and um, carry uh, guns in residential areas for self defense? How does that impact your argument about the dangers? Of, of guns in, in residential areas? Well, you know, I don't think it affects that because our reasons for, for the zoning of gun ranges involves um, the attraction of gun theft, um, leg contamination at ranges, uh, the potential for fire when you're, you have large volumes of, of ammunition stored there, and noise pollution. That isn't the same thing. As Do you have any record across the country of fires being extraordinarily... Uh, happening at uh, gun ranges as opposed to other locations? No, I do not have that, but we do know that we have combustible material involved, and so there's, you know, 
a reason to take safety precautions. And why can't those concerns be addressed by narrowly tailored regulations aimed at those specific problems as opposed to these use restrictions? They can be, but again, we submit they can be addressed in more one way. And I would, I would submit that well, we no, you've got to, you've got to demonstrate a substantial fit between the means you've chosen to achieve those objectives, and and that requires more than speculation. We'd, we don't rely on fire alone. We don't rely on the potential for lead um, pollution in the environment alone. Uh, we rely on these things in combination because that's what the zoning and right. And in combination, all of those concerns can be addressed by more narrowly tailored regulations that are aimed at actually solving those problems instead of uh, these restrictions on where gun ranges can locate. We submit they are narrowly tailored. Um, and that the city's safety objectives would be achieved less. less well, you can assert that, but you have to demonstrate it. Well, if if a range, if a gun range is attracting theft into a you know a, a B district, for example, right. so you can require that, some security measures, as your expert in the last round well, of this litigation testified. That's not the approach that, that the court has taken in the First Amendment cases like Renton or Young. I mean, bringing crime to a neighborhood is considered a concern okay. that justifies. There were well-documented records in Renton and Alameda that, books about secondary crime effects on the immediate neighborhood where adult bookstores and adult entertainment um, was located. And, okay. and there is no such record here. Well, we do have it. evidence that firing ranges... Um, and one, especially ones with gun stores in them are attractive to people. You have so some highly anecdotal evidence of gun theft at gun stores. We have anecdotal evidence that I think adds up. We have 14 and examples. We also have the ATF's report. And that's not proof of secondary effects because you don't have any evidence to show that guns stolen from gun stores are used in the immediate vicinity of the gun store to commit a crime. But we do have evidence that, that this use brings crime to neighborhood and I submit oh, What evidence is that? Our evidence of the thefts in gun stores over, within a two year period, 14 of the larger ones involving, involving dozens of guns stolen at one time. We have ATF's estimate over 16,000 firearms dealers reporting gun thefts in a year. And we have Lieutenant Johnson's testimony um, about tracing guns and gun, gun crimes, and he testified um, that a large number of guns um, that are recovered in crime um, are right, traced. That doesn't have any bearing on the location issue. And this is all about where they can locate. The location is a location where crime occurs, and we think those are best distance. It from. would occur anywhere. Right, if if and we don't have to show they're that susceptible we'll of time. gun theft, that's going to occur anywhere. Um, and what we're talking about is whether there's a record of collateral crime in the immediate vicinity, because we're talking about again use zoning where they can locate. The crime may occur. We don't need to show that it will stop the crime, but it, this is a reason to remove. It's a new crime. It's a new. It's a different type of crime. It brings gun runners and gun thieves into neighborhoods, and we submit those are better placed. Where do you get that? Areas. I read your brief. Where does that come from? You know, your experts didn't say that didn't that they bring crime into the neighborhood. Well, that they attract they attract theft, and that is a crime. So do grocery stores, convenience stores, gas stations. Well, they don't attract gun runners and gun thieves who will either either uh, steal guns that will enter the illegal market or um, be used in in violent crimes. Uh, so it would bring a new. Uh, 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 how how different how different uh, would your arguments uh, uh, be if um, uh, the gun range? If a, if a gun range uh, did not also have a gun store? Um, our case would not, would not be as strong, but here we have an ordinance that, um, that there are still, you know, gun ranges do attract that. We do still have evidence of that, but we also have a situation where gun ranges can 
And from my understanding, from, a, from the testimony in this case, is that they often do or will, because that's considered um, how you uh, um, can run a range economically. Um, and also, gun ranges still are going to, you know, likely have large caches of weapons in in the facility. Um, well, so does the Cabela's um, five miles from my house, and so do Bass Pro Shops that are located um, in in and near um, normal commercial districts all over the country. Well, I don't know. I can't speak to those specific examples. I don't know them. I can't. Um, and some of those gun sellers gun. have ranges, right? And offer um, permitting classes and safety classes and, and, and of range course, training. And other cities, I don't know. I don't know whether those are industrial districts that are near commercial areas. I don't. I can't comment on the details of those specific examples. But we do know that there are a number of cities around the country that um, that zone similarly, similarly shooting ranges similarly to the way Chicago does. Um, and as plaintiffs point out in their reply brief, what cities? Uh, Charleston. Um, Orlando, Atlanta, we have a list um, that, we, that, that is set out in our reply brief. And what plaintiffs pointed out in their reply brief is that, that you know, shooting ranges have opened up in those cities with similar type zoning. Orlando, for example, a thousand foot buffer between schools, parks, churches, um, and residential areas, a conditional use in two industrial districts. Um, so, and Orlando is industrial zoning also with a 500 buffer between residential and uh, residential districts. Well, and those comparisons of, are really of limited utility here because we don't know what their zoning map looks like. We don't know, um, you know, where well, their schools and parks, etc., are located. It's very difficult to make those comparisons. What we that do is know true, is that no range has successfully opened under this regime in the city of Chicago. Well, I think that it was, what it does teach is that industrial zoning is not something that range owners stay away from. In fact, Mr. Giordano, their expert testified, lots of ranges are open in industrial areas. Right, it's obviously a compatible use, um, but why is it not also compatible with a commercial district or a business district? I don't know that there's any evidence to support that judgment. Well, because the, well, we would submit that's because those are the more populated areas where these particular dangers that occur at shooting ranges. Um, I mean, if we were just looking at this in terms of fact and function, um, we would construe this as a commercial use, right? Or a recreational use, maybe? Um, Take away the whole gun control debate and that um, maybe a political type of recreational overlay, use. Right? Yes, and those are treated differently one from the other under the zoning ordinance. You know, the United Center is going to be treated differently than, um, you know, a cabaret or an adult use, you know, playtime theaters is going to be treated very differently. Um, so, Ms. Luz, uh, are, are, there, are there really places for hunting in the city of Chicago? There are. In the city of Chicago? Could, there are a could, couple over could, Wolf Lake and Lake Calumet, very limited. Obviously, there aren't very many places appropriate for hunting in the city of Chicago. Can a 16-year-old uh -huh. hunt there? We have not prohibited minors from hunting there. We view the problem as very different. It's, it's wide open, um, not, not as much congestion or potential for distraction, and, of course, not the same potential for lead contamination. You're not old enough to remember, but uh, there was skeet shooting along Lakeshore. Right downtown. Do you remember? Or you probably don't remember that. No, Are I you don't aware remember of that? it. I have heard about that, yes. Did that you create know, a lot of crime there? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that, you know, teenagers. Those were the people at the Saddle and Cycle Club, Judge Caney. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we're, we, I don't think it created a lot of crime there. Didn't create a lot of crime? I'm sorry, I'm not really familiar, familiar enough to address that. Um, well, it wasn't situation. closed down because of, of uh, crime, but there was lead pollution that closed. Well, and lead pollution is a serious concern when it comes to, um, 
you know, with minors especially, and I don't think that can be minimized. Maybe we've learned something since um, since that range was. I think, in but however, the outdoor range though, so the problems would be different. The uh, ability to uh, mitigate the uh, deleterious effect of uh, lead pollution is. Uh, uh, improved considerably since that was uh, uh, and, an you know, case. And, and yet it still exists. And for Why this, can't I'd that like... be addressed by a narrowly tailored um, environmental regulation as opposed to a ban? Well, I would submit that both both approaches are needed. And for this, I would point to the study in the NIOSH report that plaintiffs cite in their brief on uh, in the reply on page 21, which involved um, several ranges that were studied, um, three rifle teams used one of the ranges um, that turned out to have extensive lead contaminations, and the students had elevated lead levels. I thought Before, that location didn't have appropriate environmental controls. That is true. And my point is, I don't, the cleaning problems aren't going to solve all the problems. Those, children's had, those children have lead contamination. They, they had that elevated lead Right, because lead it, was, it was not um, appropriately equipped to deal with that. That's correct. But I think the last example, example shows that problems can persist even when there are regulations as a practical reality. It will take time um, before these problems are discovered and shut down, and in the meantime, children are poisoned. So uh, I see that I'm out expired. of time. Your time has expired, Council, but I'll give you uh, uh, three minutes on rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Alan Gurr for the Appellees and the Cross Appellants in this case. Uh, by the time that we got to the City's final brief in this matter, the City was reduced to arguing with its own designated 30B6 witness, uh, claiming that Commissioner Krimble had merely offered her personal opinion when she said that the age restriction was onerous, poorly drafted, overbroad, and should be rewritten. That's quite a statement, uh, probably the strongest witness that we could call. It's very hard to see how a restriction which is described in that manner by the city's own witness could possibly pass constitutional scrutiny either under the First or Second Amendment. So I'd like to start with that. When 16-year-olds set out to go hunting in the city of Chicago, uh, something I guess uh, we learn uh, something new every day in this, uh, in this courtroom, uh, they should probably have some training and some familiarity with firearms so that they're not a danger to themselves and to other people uh, in the city. Uh, Commissioner Krimble understood that because she took her son to a shooting class for hunter safety when he was 12 years old, and she testified as the city's expert witness, so to speak, 30B6 witness, that she believes it's appropriate to start teaching firearm safety to uh, children at the ages of 14 and 15. We would not suggest a uh, minimum age for the city. What we would suggest is that this is primarily uh, a matter best left for parents to decide at what age, under what circumstances, their own children uh, are responsible enough and mature enough in order to handle this type of training. But what we do know is that throughout American history, uh, uh, throughout this country, since time immemorial, it has been an essential aspect of our nation's history and traditions to instruct young people in the shooting sports and firearm safety, uh, not just because it means that they are safer when they go out to hunt in a large city like Chicago, but also because this is essentially a, uh, an aspect of uh, people's own Second Amendment rights. Uh, the Heller case tells us that transmitting uh, knowledge and use of arms to one's children is, is an aspect of, of the right to arms, uh, but also because it prepares those kids uh, when they grow up to be able to exercise those rights as responsible adults. We don't M Mr. Gura, minors um, have extremely limited Second Amendment rights of their own, uh, if they have any. <laughs> And the city needs very little justification to infringe upon whatever rights that they have. The fact that um, children can hunt and carry weapons elsewhere doesn't mean that the city needs to allow them to fire guns at a range. Um, issues with lead and the anecdotal evidence of children being killed or killing um, may very well be uh, sufficient uh, 
justification? Your Honor, we would agree that the children do not have the same Second Amendment rights as adults and nowhere near the same scope of rights that adults have when it comes to firearms. However, it is both the Second Amendment matter, and I'll address the First Amendment matter as well, an aspect of the rights of the parents of those children as well as the children themselves to obtain some instruction and some training and familiarity in the use of arms. Of course, the city has an interest in firearm safety when it comes to children, and there's no dispute about that. But this is a law that simply goes way too far. To quote the city's... Look, Mr. Poore, forgive me for interrupting, but the plaintiffs or anyone else, for that matter, may advocate to teens about the importance of gun rights, may teach about gun safety, may do whatever form of advocacy that they want. They can even teach shooting on realistic 3D simulators. There's no expressive content to firing a real gun as opposed to a simulator. Your Honor, there is expressive conduct, an expressive aspect in teaching firearm safety and in learning how to use guns. And as the Fourth Circuit found in the Edwards case, that type of class involving the actual use of firearms has at least First Amendment protection. The conveying of information, the training, a practical experience is a conduct that is inherently imbued with First Amendment protection. There's no way to teach someone how to... Can anyone teach a class on firearm safety and usage right? Can anyone do that? People can teach the class, yes, but they can't teach how... Right, and such a class can include as much advocacy about gun rights as you may want. The class can advocate that everyone should carry an assault rifle. The class can advocate that felons should have assault rifles, that minors should have assault rifles. Could even teach minors about how to make a gun, provided that that gun is not for sale. I do not understand where the restriction of expressive speech comes in. Your Honor... I really don't. Your Honor, all those subjects are not at issue in the case. We're not claiming that the right to teach various political ideals about firearms or anything else is being violated in this case. What we are saying, though, is that courts have recognized repeatedly, for example, in the Holder case, most recently at the Supreme Court, that training people to do something is not conduct, it is speech. The government had this argument in the Holder case most recently that providing instruction and training in how to do various things was merely conduct and not speech. The Supreme Court disagreed. It upheld the regulation, but it said that the training aspects were speech. In the Fourth Circuit, we had cases about teaching a class in fiber arts. There was a claim made by homeschool parents who wanted to access government facilities so they can have the fiber arts club meet at the facility. The court upheld the regulation, but upheld it as a restriction on speech because it understood that that classroom involved teaching, it involved training, it involved communication. And, of course, in Edwards, where you had a person who was teaching a class, a firearms safety class necessary to obtain a permit, and that involved not just speech, oral speech, but it also involved the training and the use of firearms. And when people go to a range, if someone were to go to the American Legion range here in Morton Grove and see Mr. Brown teaching his students how to use firearms, how to shoot firearms, everyone would understand that that is expressive conduct, that that is a form of learning which is going on. Now, it's true that this regulation is not written in the sense that they're targeting a class specifically. The city can say with some support that the regulation targets conduct, that is, the conduct of having young people visiting a range. But that conduct undeniably burdens a form of expression because it prohibits access to the places where people would go and obtain this learning and this training. And so we have to, at the very least, apply it at the absolute minimum, apply the O'Brien test. And here, 
the city can't possibly prevail because its own witness said that the law was overbroad. She said it was onerous. She said it should be rewritten. And once we have the city's 30B6 witness tell us that the law should be rewritten because it, 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 because it, uh, it goes much further than necessary, uh, then I, I suppose we've established our, our First Amendment claim. Uh, even if you look at it in terms of whether the governmental interest would be achieved less effectively absent the regulation, uh, here the answer would have to be no. First of all, the city does have a great many regulations dealing with lead, uh, lead abatement, lead safety. There's no shortage of these narrowly tailored regulations that Judge Sykes uh, mentioned. And in fact, lead was never mentioned uh, in any of these depositions. The city never offered lead abatement uh, as a reason to have the age restriction or any other kind of restriction for that matter. This is something that came up with their, uh, uh, in their briefs later, but the evidence was not there uh, initially. We know that small children don't go running around ranges uh, anyway, it's something that uh, no range owner would ordinarily tolerate, so a, a lot of that effect uh, might not add anything. But perhaps more to the point, we know that uh, reducing accidents is a goal, and actually a goal which is often achieved by firearms education. So if the city's goal is to reduce deaths and accidents, if they want to make the interaction between children, uh, I should say minors, we're not talking about little children, if they want to make the interaction between people and firearms safer, then they have to take into account the positive aspects that are transmitted in this form of training, which they have not done at all. So it's not just a, a, a they can't say, well, we're going to ban it and therefore it won't happen and then we don't have to worry about the hazards of it. When they ban training and they, when they ban education, they're actually increasing the risk of harm that they're supposedly attempting to ameliorate. The district court never got to the city's reasons for the age restriction, um, but found that there were no Second Amendment rights um, for children at all, uh, relying on the Fifth Circuit's decision in the NRA case and the First Circuit's decision in Rene E. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. it, um, we need to either distinguish or grapple somehow with those two cases. Sure. Uh, the, uh, the evidence in those cases, I'm not sure that the majority opinion, and by the way, it was, it was a very closely divided case, at least in the Fifth Circuit, we had an 8-7 vote on our Bakery hearing, so reasonable people can disagree. Uh, but I'm not so sure that we can read that case, even the majority's opinion, to say uh, necessarily that, um, uh, that there are no rights at all, because they went to step two of the analysis uh, in that case. Uh, they, they wrote in their opinion that they suspect that the age restriction would survive at step one of the two-step process, but they felt compelled to at least go ahead and address, to address it also in terms of... Um, of the actual balancing under intermediate scrutiny in that case. Right, and, but was that in the nature of an alternative holding? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's kind of vague, Your Honor. I think, it's, I think you could, uh, uh, I'm not so sure. I think, uh, I don't have the language directly in front of me right now, but the way they phrased it was, you know, that they, they felt better about needing to go ahead and, and go on to the second step. I think they said they had doubts about whether it survived or failed at step one. Uh, but but they, they quickly got off step one and spent a lot of effort on step two. And, of course, there are many judges who think that that case was decided entirely wrong. What we know from those cases and the record that they developed, as well as the record we developed here, is that there is a, a, an American tradition, uh, a great American tradition, of teaching uh, younger people, people younger than 18, how to use guns. Even the federal handgun ban, the juvenile federal handgun ban, has an exception for target practice, hunting, or a course of instruction in the safe and lawful use of a handgun. And this is as recently as 1994, Congress recognized that even handguns, you should be allowed or are normally expected to be allowed to, to people under 18, at least in a course of instruction. We're not talking here about children going to a store and buying guns and ammunition. That's absolutely not what we're arguing about. But what we are arguing about is <clears throat> whether or not uh, the city's very valid uh, safety concerns for people's ability to use firearms are going to be uh, advanced <clears throat> uh, when you ban people who are under 18 from obtaining training. And American tradition experience says, no, they won't. This is you know, not a surprise that in this country where firearms are so prevalent and so deeply ingrained in our constitutional tradition, that there is also a tradition of giving access to firearms to people under 18, at the very least for the purpose of learning how to use them so that, so that so tragedies are minimized and so they are better able to go ahead and exercise those rights when they do obtain the age of majority. Um, I'd like to circle 
back a little bit to the zoning uh, aspect, if I might, for just a minute. Uh, it's not uh, only that there are no gun ranges in Chicago uh, available to um, available to the public. Uh, all the efforts that were made, as far as the city was concerned, to go ahead and see if a range could be established failed, and they all failed for zoning. That's in the record. Uh, people called. Uh, they tried to work with the zoning officials, uh, and they hung up or were basically told, no, the property you're, you're thinking of uh, isn't available. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's absolutely in the record that zoning is the limiting principle here, which is the reason why there are no gun ranges available to the public. Now, that doesn't mean there are no gun ranges in Chicago, as Judge Candy noted. There are a lot of gun ranges in Chicago. Those are ranges are open uh, to police, to government officials. I believe there's one at the courthouse. Uh, Mr. Gura, forgive me, but could you stay a little closer to the mic? Sure. I'm having some trouble hearing you. Sorry. I hope that's better. Um, we know that there are many... Oh, that's many one. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Uh, we know that there are many gun rangers in Chicago, and we also know something else. The city has never received a single complaint from anybody about the operation and use of these gun rangers by the police, by, uh, by alarm companies, uh, by federal judges perhaps in this courtroom. Um, we know that uh, it's not an issue, and it's not an issue because those gun ranges have some rules involved with them and because they're built to modern standards. Uh, now, the city says, well, the, the government ranges, are, those are government ranges, and so we know that those are going to be really good. The private ranges uh, might be a little bit more dangerous. We would dispute that. We don't, we're not so sure that this is the case in which to litigate, that everything the government does is necessarily going to be a, a, of a higher class than what the private sector is going to accomplish. But we do know, as a matter of fact, that uh, ranges are simply not a problem when they occur, not just in other cities, but also in this city. Uh, the idea that... Um, that the zoning uh, has not been uh, uh, an issue here. I don't think the evidence supports that. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence to, to justify any of these zoning restrictions whatsoever. It's not just that the evidence is insufficient. It doesn't exist at all. And I would also uh, suggest that um, when the witnesses for Chicago were asked about their lack of evidence, they also said something else. They also admitted that all their concerns were speculative. So it's not just that they're uh, they have even a deep belief in some of these anecdotes that have occurred in other places. But their concerns themselves are speculative. A crime once happened somewhere, it could happen here. And from there we go on to a gun range blowing up a liquor store 490 feet away from the location. Uh, I submit it doesn't make much sense uh, uh, in any event, unless there are any other questions. I think uh, we're done. Judge Rovner, any further questions? Yeah, I did. Uh, Mr. Gray, I did want to ask you something. Um, um, from 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 the briefs. Um, as for uh, the substantial burden test, you argued uh, that the law is determined but once, and that the substantial burden test was rejected below. But since Second Amendment means end inquiry is a sliding um, scale. Couldn't it be that an ordinance that bans all firing ranges could be viewed under a much stricter um, burden and ordinances that merely regulate are viewed under a substantial burden test? We are not reviewing the same ordinance here, are we? Well, the ordinance may be different, but I'm, there are two ways we can do a substantial burden test, and I think this court has foreclosed both of those. Uh, one way to do a substantial burden test, and I believe this is the way that the Second Circuit does it, and it's the only circuit in the country that does it, is it does it as sort of a, uh, a, a preemptive test, a sort of a threshold test, that if, this, if the burden is considered to be not uh, substantial, then, uh, then they don't even address uh, anything beyond rational basis. Another way to think of it, and, and that's erroneous for, for reasons I think that were explained very adequately by this court in Ezel 1. The other way to do a substantial burden test is to sort of wrap it into the Ezel 1 analysis, which is to say that we uh, adjust the standard of review based upon the level of the burden so that a, uh, a very strong and heavy burden gets a higher level of scrutiny. And here we submit that level should be strict scrutiny given the uh, very heavy burdens that are imposed, whereas uh, an incidental burden, one that's more tangential, perhaps uh, would go down no further than intermediate scrutiny. But there's no court in the country 
that's held um, that as at the second step analysis that the courts should apply anything other than uh, intermediate scrutiny. And even under intermediate scrutiny, it's the government that bears the burden of showing some close fit between its interests and the regulation at hand. And Chicago hasn't come close to doing that. As far as going to this uh, De Castro Second Circuit style undue burden test, which is, I think, where the city was going, where they want to say, well, these burdens aren't substantial, let's just have rational basis. I don't think that's appropriate. And yes, it is, at this point, law of the case, because this case will never end. If every time there's an appeal, the city can try again and try again and try again to rewrite the rules, uh, if they were to succeed, then they can go back to the beginning, write the rule that would have perhaps met that burden uh, the first time, and we'd be back at square one. Litigation has to end its and, and you believe so because, um, at, at, or I should say, despite the fact that um, uh, the original case um, involved banning shooting ranges, banning and this is a case regulating. Well, it is, it is, as Judge Sykes said, a ban. It's a ban of having a range in some places. But even if it were viewed, even if we were to view it as a, as a regulatory case, uh, under mm-hmm. EZL-1, you would look to the, uh, the severity of the, the regulation, as it were. The regulation here is very severe. The district court certainly thought it was severe, excluding 90% uh, of the city's land, of the, uh, of the city's commercial land from gun ranges, 98% perhaps of all the land, is a severe restriction. It's one that's, that's caused a lot of problems here, as we've seen as the record has demonstrated. And so um, even if we were to view this as a regulatory measure, we would still wind up in strict scrutiny. And as far as the age restriction is concerned, that is a total ban. It's a ban on the rights of the people who would exercise those rights, but they can't access the range at all. For people under 18 or for the parents of those people who want to exercise their right to teach their children uh, uh, how to shoot, that does work as a total ban as well. Uh, in any event, I, you know, even if you were to go to intermediate scrutiny, which is as low as you could go, there is still zero evidence here. You still have witnesses who said repeatedly over and over and over again, I don't know how many times, no data, no data, no data. It's speculative. They admitted it was speculative. Um, that you had one witness who said, that the law should be rewritten because it's a terrible law. We agree with her. Uh, and, I, you know, you, it's hard to see how you can survive any form of constitutional scrutiny when your own witnesses as the government come in and say, the law is terrible and needs to be rewritten. Thank you, Congress. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Congress. Jesus? I realize my time is short, and I'll just make a couple of very brief comments. First, with regard to the scope of the Second Amendment right for minors, I would just point out that a ruling on um, those grounds might well create a conflict in the circuits. Um, Well, I'm not so sure about that. The case in the First Circuit had to do with the federal law um, banning juveniles from possessing firearms, but it has all kinds of exceptions. And... The historical evidence that was marshaled in that case did not address itself to what's at issue here, which is the right of um, juveniles, minors, to engage in target practice, controlled target practice. Well, I, I would submit the case does have some bearing on the rights, the Second Amendment rights of juveniles, but I will also address your uh, particular question. There is, um, for, for as for um, the right to juveniles to, to uh engage in target practice at um, a shooting range, I would submit that there is a long history of um, restricting minors' access to firearms, and we point to regulations that were compiled by Mark Frasetto. Do do any of those historical examples address um, target practice by minors, controlled target practice, supervised target practice? They do. They do not. Uh, they do. Some do contain exceptions. These these are these are restrictions on minors that include a possession, use, loaning, and furnishing. Some of them were very broad and contained no exceptions. Sales, for target practice. that sort of thing. 
right. furnishing or loaning to minors as well. I, um, that was not just purchased or possessed. Right. Um, and these, some did contain, a couple did contain exceptions for parental supervision and others did not. And we submit that that shows that the age cutoff varied and the scope varied about what minors would be allowed to do. Right, but it demonstrates Which, that that underage persons, persons under the age of 21, are not wholly without Second Amendment rights. Well, it demonstrates that a lot of minors were restricted from receiving firearms um, for any purpose at all. Right. But the, and that it was a matter of state regulation where the exact cutoff would be. Right. But the point at step one of the inquiry is whether there's conclusive evidence that minors are categorically unprotected. In other words, have no Second Amendment rights at all or have, do not have have the Second Amendment right that's implicated in this case, which is the right to receive range training and target practice at a range. And I would submit these broad prohibitions on minors having guns for any purpose um, shows that this is a matter of state regulation. But you just and said it, that they are not all-purpose laws. I'm sorry? You just said they were not all-purpose laws. Well, they were. some of them were broad prohibition. Most of them were broad prohibitions. Two were a, pro, a blanket prohibition on any possession. There were a and number there of were exceptions. The others were um, prohibitions on sales um, and so forth, carrying. I see that my time has run. So you we, can answer this question, certainly. Okay. Um, well, what I think that these what these what these um, restrictions show is that they were quite varied and that it was left to the legislature to decide um, the scope of rights uh, to be given to these, you know, older teens, um, minor, 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 the age of minority was often the cutoff point. Um, and so I would submit that was not understood to be a Second Amendment right on behalf of... of I'll give you minors. another minute if you want to wrap up. and. Okay. Well, I, I wanted to just briefly correct... Um, a comment about the record. My opposing counsel said there were that there were all kinds of examples of people checking in and being rejected on zoning, and that's just not the case. Um, I already talked about the people we know who, who checked in. Um, I believe he was referring to three or four phone calls that were made to, to Ms. Cudiero. That's a normal part of the planning process for anybody who wants to open up a business. And um, they could have even all been Mr. Roebuck, who we know after a few phone calls found a compliant location. So, uh, in short, we, in conclusion, we do ask that the judgment of the district court be reversed with respect to the M zoning of shooting ranges and affirmed with respect to the 500 foot buffer and the age restriction. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thanks to both counsel. The case will be taken under advisement.